Okay, welcome everyone. Um, today, we want to look at the challenge of creating artificially intelligent machines that are aligned with human values. And to do this, I am joined by Brian Christian, who is an author of three books. You've written a book on uh, called The Most Human Human, and then one on algorithms to live by, which you co-author with, with uh, Tom Griffith, and now The Alignment Problem, How Artificial Intelligence Learns Human Values, which I have enjoyed. So welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Maybe we can start with you give it, giving us a, a big off, bit of your, your background. Uh, and where are you joining us from, by the way? Uh, I'm in San Francisco, California. Very good. Very good. I'm just north of, of London today. So how did you end up writing books on AI and values? Um, I've had, I think, a pretty idiosyncratic um, trajectory in terms of my background. I was a computer science and philosophy double major. Um, and so from a very early stage, I was seeing those two disciplines as in contact and thinking about computer science in some ways um, as an empirical way to actually address some of the oldest philosophical questions about, you know, how does the mind work? What makes us human? Um, and I think, you know, we're living at a, a uniquely thrilling time if you're interested in those sorts of questions. Um, and so I ended up going to graduate school for creative writing, and I have ended up essentially at the uh, the intersection of all three of those fields. Um, and uh, that has taken me to the books that have uh, brought me here today. Very good. Now, and and I have to say, reading your book, it, it brings in so many different elements from philosophy to really questioning what makes us human and, and do we really understand our own values before we try to program machines that, that can 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 deliver on those values. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, Maybe we can start off broad and say, what, what, mm. what do you see as some of the biggest problems with AI today? Well, we're clearly living through, I think, a pretty transformative time. Um, and in particular, the field of machine learning, which is kind of a subdivision of AI. Um, mm. and machine learning is uh, the study of systems that essentially learn by example rather than being explicitly programmed by hand. Um, you know, this has been around since the 1950s, uh, or, or before arguably, but, um, it has really taken a sharp turn starting in about 2012, um, with the rise of so-called deep learning or deep neural networks. Um, we saw, you know, to take one example, benchmarks for computer vision, uh, error rates dropped by something like 50% in a single year. Um, that that does not happen every day. Um, and I think th they went down by about 92% in a five or six year period. And so I think we're in some ways still kind of living through the reverberations of that breakthrough. Um, and that I think presents a unique set of challenges. We are both kind of pushing the frontier of machine learning at a kind of unheard of pace. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, in, I think, subtler ways, uh, machine learning systems uh, are, are moving through the civic decision making uh, process, they're, they're moving into public institutions, they're part of healthcare, they're part of lending, they are part of the criminal justice system. And so I think there's really Kind of two fronts here one is like the the actual state of the art in terms of large language models that can you know essentially pass the turing test as far as i'm concerned autonomous cars etc cetera, etc cetera. um but then you also have simpler models you know maybe less kind of sexy in terms of the actual state of the art but they are moving through these institutions that you know touch our lives in so many different ways and so you know there's this fundamental question uh, that we now know as the alignment problem, but it has a, a history that goes back to the early 1960s um, and the MIT cyberneticist Norbert Wiener, who wrote, I think very presciently back 
back in that incredibly early moment, um, he likened these systems to the story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, um, you know, which we most of us know as the Disney cartoon where Mickey Mouse enchants this broom and tells it, you know, I, I need I need you to fetch water from the, the well and fill it up in, in this cauldron. Um, and because he's somewhat imprecise in how he specifies exactly what he wants done, one thing leads to another and, and Mickey Mouse is on the point of drowning uh, before the master appears and is able to sort of call a stop to things. And Wiener argued, uh, you know, this is not the stuff of fairy tales. This is, this is exactly the kind of thing that's waiting for us if we develop these systems that are sufficiently general or sufficiently powerful. And they're designed to just kind of get the gist of what we want them to do based on, you know, being shown examples. There's this fundamental question of, are they learning what we think they're learning? You know, will they generalize from the examples that we give them to something, you know, in the real world? And fundamentally, will they do what we want? And so I think we are really at a moment in society where we are we are filling the world up with these brooms, so to speak. And this is becoming a, a real issue. OK, so what are your favorite examples that illustrate some of the misalignment? I mean, I don't know if I would call this a favorite example, but uh, a, a striking example was um, there was an Uber autonomous car in Arizona in 2018 <clears throat> that ended up striking and killing a pedestrian. And uh, if you read the National Transportation Safety Board report of the accident, um, it's a very, I think, telling uh, case of how machine learning can go wrong. And so it appears to be the case that there were no images of jaywalkers in the training data that was used uh, to train this car. And so the car was just fundamentally not prepared to encounter a person in the middle of the road, you know, not at a crosswalk or an intersection. Um, and furthermore, the system had been built as many machine learning, you know, object classifiers are, it had been built on this very brittle ontology of, you know, there are six categories of things. There are pedestrians, cyclists, cars, trucks, you know, debris, whatever. Um, and everything that you will encounter is exactly one of those categories. And it had been given thousands of examples of each of those categories. This, this is the, the typical, you know, training process. But this particular woman was walking a bicycle across the street. And so it sort of broke this brittle category structure and going back through the transcripts of what was happening inside the car in the moments before the crash, we can see that it's actually changing its mind at something like 30 hertz, 30 times per second, it's changing its mind. Oh, I think that's a pedestrian. No, I think that's a cyclist. No, I'm, you know, they're definitely walking. I'm, no, there's definitely a bike frame and tires. What's going on? Um, <clears throat> and so I think that's that's a useful way for thinking about how real world systems can go wrong when the stakes are truly high. And it's a function of, I, I would say, really two things primarily. The first is this uh, question of the training data. Does the data on which the system is trained fundamentally represent reality? And it turns out, no, there was this key concept that, you know, called jaywalking that was not present. Um, and secondly, uh, we can think about what's called the objective function of the system, which is how do we mathematically define uh, what we want the system to actually do? And in this case, it was, you know, maximize the probability that the object belongs to one of these rigid categories but everything in the training data did belong to exactly one of those categories. Um, and in the real world, it doesn't really matter if someone is a cyclist or a pedestrian because the rules are the same either way. You want to avoid them no matter what. And so um, it's an example of how I think fairly intuitive system design can go deeply wrong. Um, and so in that sense, I think it's a, it's a cautionary tale about machine learning generally.
Yeah, and I, I, one of the things I like about the, this book, about your book, is that you you paint a, a really nice picture of how AI has evolved from a a system that is 50 years old where we relied on programming algorithms looking at mainly codified knowledge to machine learning today so in the past machines couldn't address any any things we have learned and picked up from experience um, and all the mistakes were basically in the algorithms itself then we entered the world of machine learning and deep learning where we don't tell the algorithms what the, what we know but we let them learn from experience and this is where machine vision um the improvements came in and, and many other aspects but the problem with this is that they are as, as you're saying in your book they are basically just mathematical functions of 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 a map of observations um, that we map to to outcomes and um, and therefore we have to rely on the data which brings lots of problems around bias and representation um, do you want to give us some examples yeah. around that yeah I mean I think there's as as you're indicating you know there there are two problems here one is you know does the system fail to uh get the correct impression of what we're trying to teach it uh the other side of that question is does the system in some ways learn too much uh learn even the things we weren't trying to teach it and i think that's something that really comes through um in the space of language models so for example if you look at the cutting edge in large language models things like gpt3 from OpenAI. Um, you can, you know, for listeners who aren't familiar, they're sort of autocomplete on steroids. Um, and they'll, they'll autocomplete, you know, your entire uh, term paper for you. Um, I mean, it's really striking. Uh, and these systems are built on huge corpora of text that is scraped from books and the internet. Um, there's also a version uh, that will autocomplete code for you. Um, and Microsoft brands this as GitHub Copilot. And that is trained on uh, basically all the open source code on GitHub. Uh, and here you have a huge problem, which is that, you know, just, just to stick to the example of uh, prose, um, well, I guess both examples are relevant. You know, there's there's a lot of buggy code with security vulnerabilities in it, and the system is learning from that. And so it's going to produce other code that has bugs and security vulnerabilities. Um, and then in the case of prose, I mean, anyone... Uh, familiar with the internet knows that it's full of extremely toxic, uh, you know, racist, sexist, um, uninformed, uh, ungrammatical <laughs> um, text, including large swaths of text that is itself produced by low grade AI bots, you know, generating SEO spam and so forth. Um, and so you see this in, you know, manifesting in the autocomplete. Um, you, uh, I mean, Microsoft had a chatbot several years ago that ended up saying all these kind of anti-Semitic things. Um, there are many subtler examples where, uh, for example, uh, earlier versions of GPT, if you said, my wife has a new job starting tomorrow, she's going to be blank. You'd often get completions like, you know, uh, a housekeeper or something like this. Whereas if you said, my husband has a new job starting tomorrow, he'll be, and it would autocomplete with like, you know, the head of finance or something, something. And so this is merely a reflection of the actual statistics of how these words connect on the internet. Um, but if, if one is uncareful, then you simply have a system that kind of reproduces humanity, you know, warts, warts and all. And in particularly, I think, dangerous cases, if you used a language model to sort resumes for a job opening, uh, then you would find yourself unwittingly amplifying this bias because the system would, I mean, there are documented cases of this, kind of filtering out resumes from women for an engineering role because the language model says, uh, these these resumes don't look like the typical engineer resume, so we're gonna sort of throw them away. Um, and so uh, 
I think there's a real range of possibilities here from merely sort of reflecting humanity at its best and worst to unwittingly, you know, kind of deepening those problems as they already exist. So yeah, this is a huge issue. Yeah, and I, I think what we are seeing now is more awareness around the problem of bias in algorithms, the problems of bias in, in data itself. And actually, once we're aware of it, we can then start to tackle this and, and hopefully make our AIs less biased. Um, another challenge that that you cover in your book is, is transparency um, with machine learning, especially with deep learning models, comes a level of complexity that we don't understand. So the challenge is that we give the machine data, it then comes up with a model, which is very similar to us humans, I guess. We don't know how I am recognizing a cat on a photograph. I can't explain it. This is something I've picked up through experience. Now we have these black box algorithms that do something similar. Um, so how, how do we start to address that? Mm. Uh, broadly, I think there's two avenues of attack here. Um, as you say, you know, deep learning has been an incredible technology in terms of just sort of blowing away benchmarks in all sorts of fields from yeah, language to vision uh, to robotics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it leaves us with this problem, which is that by default, the, you know, the, the internal workings of the network are, are, inscrutable. Um, and so I think there's there's two things we can do here. The first is to develop techniques to essentially pop the hood and visualize in some interpretable way what is happening inside the network. So we've seen some incredible work. Um, people like Chris Ola, his colleagues at OpenAI and Anthropic have done some amazing work at essentially reverse engineering existing neural networks used for vision and finding like, okay, we've located the neuron that identifies things as a car and we can see how it has these sort of tributaries of here's the part that's identifying the wheel. Here's the part that's identifying the windshield. Um, and, you know, it's a bewildering amount of information, but you can sort of explore the network at your own pace and just see how everything in interconnects. Um, so I, I think that's really encouraging. Uh, we're seeing people like Bean Kim at Google Brain has developed some techniques uh, for exploring how high-level concepts like, uh, you know, a color, something being red or something being striped or, you know, uh, things like this, how they contribute to the ultimate classification that a system makes. And one of my favorite examples is that she found in one of Google's networks called Inception uh, that an object being red was essential to its classification of that thing as a fire truck. And I think that's a really useful example because in the US, <clears throat> almost every fire truck I've ever seen is red. In the UK, as I understand it, fire trucks are generally red. In Australia, they're not. They're mm -hmm. often neon yellow and or white. Mm -hmm. And so this is a great example of how transparency research contributes mm -hmm. to AI safety because we can say, okay, this model is actually not safe to deploy in you know, a self-driving car in Australia. So those sorts of techniques I think are have come a long way in a short span of time, and they're really powerful in terms of engendering trust in the model uh, at sort of catching certain issues in the bud, so to speak. Um, and so I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. You know, there's a little bit of a cat and a mouse dynamic where we've, the, the frontier of machine learning has moved from these sort of convolutional nets for vision to what are called transformer networks for language. And they're even bigger and they're even more complicated. And we're just kind of starting to understand them from an interpretability standpoint. So I think there's a little bit of a, a game of, you know, catch up that's being played by the interpretability community. But, you know, just a few weeks ago, we saw um, Chris Ola and his colleagues uh, put out a paper on transformers. So it's it's continuing to um, kind of follow along, and I think that to me is exciting. It's not it's not necessarily obvious that transparency is always possible, but I've been really pleasantly surprised. So that's the first half of it, right? Is like opening up the black box and figuring out what's going on inside. 
The second half of it, which in some ways I, I'm equally excited about, is how do we develop intrinsically simple models that are competitive, measured by accuracy, with neural networks? And this turns out to be also surprisingly viable. Um, so there are people, I'm thinking about uh, Rich Carwana at Microsoft Research, who's done a bunch of interpretable models for healthcare. Um, and he's used an architecture that's called mm -hmm. Um, generalized additive models where you have, uh, you know, rather than just like a giant blob of neurons, you can break the classification down into individual risk factors. So like what's your blood pressure, what's your age, you know, et cetera. And you can visualize each of those features as a sort of graph. And then the model just adds the graphs together. And so you can see whether you're the patient or the caregiver, you can see immediately um, how these different things end up affecting the model. And again, it's a great way to sort of catch uh, bugs uh, before they affect real patients. So his team found that uh, a model used for pneumonia risk prediction uh, was essentially assigning people lower risk scores if they had asthma. And that just doesn't really pass the, uh, the smell test. Uh, it doesn't quite make sense. But the reason is that at least in the data set they were using, asthmatic patients who also had pneumonia were given the highest priority care. And so they did tend to have slightly better outcomes on average, but only because of being considered high risk. And so the model doesn't know that and recommends like, oh, these people seem fine, you know, let them go home. So cases like that, again, uh, when you're using an interpretable model, you can catch it. Um, and so that's that's a relief. Uh, finally, there are people who I'm thinking about, Cynthia Rudin, a computer scientist at Duke University, has developed this idea called uh, provably optimal simple models. So, you know, we've seen with Moore's Law this, you know, incredible uh, exponential growth in computing power. Uh, on the one hand, we can use this to train bigger models than we could ever train before. Um, but Rudin's work says, no, let's do something else. Let's use this co computational windfall to search over the space of all possible simple models and find the one that is certifiably the best. Um, and so she's done work both for uh, criminal risk uh, prediction as well as uh, in medical settings, things like sleep apnea, stroke, and so forth, uh, developing a model, for example, that's she has one for criminal risk prediction. The entire model is uh, if you're under 20 years old and a male, or you're 23 and younger with two to three priors, or you're any age with three or more priors, predict that you'll be rearrested within two years. Otherwise, no. That's the entire model, and it's competitive with the best things. Uh, on offer from private vendors that are, you know, using deep neural networks and everything else. Um, and so I think that work is really powerful, particularly in cases where, um, you know, it's affecting, it's, it's essentially an extension of the law in certain mm -hmm. cases, right? And so I think the same way that we, we want the law to be kind of legible and understandable, um, it's very encouraging to me that we are seeing uh, simple models that are competitive with what you'd get from these neural networks. And so in some ways, I think there's kind of no excuse uh, to use complex models in cases like that. There's just no advantage. Very good. Yeah, and no, I completely agree. And I, I think a lot of work is happening right now to make AI more explainable. And one of my favorite examples comes from the, the again, machine vision um, research where they try to identify how AI algorithms, I predict that this is a polar bear or not. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was about the presence of snow. So if the yes. polar bear was somewhere with no snow, the machine, uh, the, the machine learning algorithm wouldn't wouldn't really detect it as a as a polar bear. So, and and you're absolutely right. The more we can get under the hood and get explainability, the better. The other downside, I guess, of um, the the machine learning and deep learning algorithms is that they rely on masses of data, and and 
lots of in lots of situations we haven't got this data and what I found interesting when when Google DeepMind trained their AIs to play the the board game Go, they started off with machine learning algorithm and fed them all the data they could capture mm. of previous games, and the AI was pretty good and and was beating the the world champion. But then it said, okay, how how about we start with no data and we just create a re reinforcement algorithm that 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 learns by playing against itself yes. so this is something you talk about in your book too so what what are your views on on reinforcement learning and some of the the challenges around that yeah so reinforcement learning as you say has been one of the most uh one of the biggest success stories um in recent years and this differs a little bit from what we've been talking about previously um, which is known as supervised learning. So in supervised learning, like, you know, vision, uh, healthcare, et cetera, you have some category or some label you're trying to predict. You know, is this person risky or not risky? Is this a cat or a dog, et cetera? Um, in reinforcement learning, as, as you've indicated, um, it's really about maximizing uh, reward and minimizing punishments over a series of uh, time steps, a series of decisions. And so this has been really instrumental in game playing, you know, Go, AlphaGo being the, the flagship example, um, as well as in things like robotics, self-driving cars, et cetera, um, and, and in language models as well. So as you say, you know, the original version of AlphaGo was based on, in part, on this supervised learning process of we're going to sample from human expert games and we are going to learn to predict the moves that a human expert player would have made and then we'll just make that move um but there's a number of issues with that the first is you know it can be expensive to get all that data the second is uh you know humans aren't necessarily the the infallible authority on the best go move in every situation and so it presents you with kind of a hard ceiling on how good the program can be um, and it was quite fascinating to watch them in their second version of the system, AlphaGo Zero, uh, throw all of that human data away and learn entirely from scratch. And that's what led to, I think, some of the most scintillating moments in its gameplay where, you know, it made a move and I'm not a, I'm not a Go expert, but you know, it's like it made an early move out on the fifth rank and everyone was shocked, like every, you know, everyone knows that you can't do that or you're like that's that's you know too aggressive or whatever uh and it worked and so that's a perfect example of the kind of thing where you know training on the received wisdom of human experts can actually hold you back yes and and i i guess the other element that you talk about is imitation learning where so we we talked about just giving um, AI is lots of data to learn from, then they can play against themselves in, in terms of reinforcement learning and achieve goals. And the other one is observing humans. Um, yeah. I guess that the, the, one of the most, one of the biggest examples is, is how Tesla is collecting data on, on how to safely drive by monitoring how everyone, every Tesla driver drives and, and how to navigate safely. Um, do you see any problems with that? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's always problems. Um, but yeah, let's. It's, it's worth, I think, first arguing for it, and then we can pick it apart. So, I mean, this is kind of the other side of what we were saying in the context of Go. So, you know, in Go, um, training on human imitation uh, has, a, has a real limitation. And you can overcome that limitation by just trying stuff out hundreds of thousands of times and eventually you can learn something that's better than what humans were doing. Now, that's not going to be the case in every domain. And driving is a perfect example where, you know, God forbid, we just put, um, you know, a randomly initialized machine learning system into a car and just let it go nuts and <laughs> figure out for itself how to uh, avoid uh, collisions. Um, and so in cases like that, it actually is really advantageous to start from a kind of human policy. Um, so start by, you know, driving the way that people drive, which is not perfect. You know, tens of thousands of people die in traffic accidents in the U.S. every year. 
but it's a starting place that's not random um, and work from there. So that's that's kind of the case for imitation. Um, and we see this in the way that children learn, right? There's there's a huge imitative capacity for human infants and human children that's almost unique to the human species, um, suggesting that it is kind of part of our evolutionary uh, inheritance that has gotten us to where we are is this ability to imitate from a very early age. Um, you know, in the 1970s, we learned that babies can imitate human uh, adults' facial expressions within something like 45 minutes of being born, um, which is just incredible. And, you know, mm. there's no analogy to that in any other species, including primates. Um, so it's obviously doing a lot of work for us. Um, and I think it's a, a way to get a kind of a safe-ish starting point in domains like driving. But there are problems, as, as you've indicated. So one of the biggest problems is if your system primarily learns from what people really do um, as they're driving, and I guess we should point out this is probably happening in many listeners' cars without them realizing it, um, particularly Tesla owners. Even if you don't have the Tesla autopilot engaged, uh, it is often running anyway in what's called shadow mode. And it's constantly asking itself hypothetical questions of how would I drive the car if I were, you know, if if I were in charge, you know, if autopilot were engaged. And it's checking its, uh, you know, proposed behavior against the way that you actually drive. And if there's a big discrepancy, it generally sends that back up to Tesla headquarters um, and goes into a data set where they're going to review it and figure out basically uh, which one of you made the mistake, the autopilot mm -hmm. or the human driver. Um, so this is really useful. Uh, the problem is that the imitation is always a little bit imperfect. And what happens when, let's say, your autopilot makes a small error and as a result, now the car is like slightly pointed off the road for a brief moment. Well, if it's an imitation learning system, it's going to look in its giant, you know, blob of training data for like, what did, what did human drivers do when they found themselves in that situation? And the answer is, well, they never ended up in that situation. So you don't know what people would have done because they never would have made that error to begin with. And now you're screwed. Um, because you're you're totally off the map and you don't have any reference point. Um, and so this is a classic uh, case that um, in the literature has the name cascading failures, which is basically like once you make a single mistake, you might end up in a situation where you have no reference point for what people would do. And then like it's just one mistake after a compounding mistake after another. Um, so that is the kind of thing that people are worried about and there are some i think very clever ideas about how to kind of patch that hole um for example there's an idea which the, there's an algorithm that's called dagger uh which basically proposes that the human and the autopilot uh trade off which one of them is controlling the car um you know several times per second and so the autopilot might screw up you know for a tenth of a second but then the human is, you know, almost without even realizing, able to correct that. And then the program can learn how the human would have corrected a situation uh, that the human never would have gotten into in, in the first place. But if you make those intervals of time small enough, um, then it's reasonably safe. And you, you give the program a little bit of an extra kind of robustness. So there's something a little bit surreal, of course, about the idea of driving your car down the street and like literally not knowing whether you're in control of it or not. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's a bit surreal, but um, the math works. So, you know, these are some of the things people are exploring. Very interesting. Um, so we, we talked about the data side and, and using either reinforcement learning or imitation learning to train those algorithms. The other side is that we need to, I guess, have align our outcomes somehow that we want to achieve and so how do we teach computers to do what we want them to do and and this is where we introduce reward functions yes. in all of this what is interesting what i liked about again in, in your book is i've been 
working with companies now for the last 20 years, helping them develop systems and incentive systems where they link certain um, outcomes to bonus schemes, for example. And, and what often happens is that this then drives unintended consequences where people start cheating or finding shortcuts. And yes. what I found really interesting is this parallel in, in your book talking about how computer algorithms are now also finding shortcuts and, and start to cheat in computer games, for example. Do you want to expand on that? Absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, as you say, the, the problem of incentives is a thorny one, very deeply human. Um, and I think it's telling that the term alignment and misalignment, which has been borrowed from the computer science community or by the computer science community from economics. Um, so this idea of how do you align the incentives of your organization, um, that is exactly the way that computer scientists are now thinking about AI. And so for any for any machine learning system, whether it's supervised learning or reinforcement learning, you need well, this thing called the objective function, which is how you're going to operationalize success. Um, and in reinforcement learning in particular uh we know it as the reward function so it's like the you know the the points system that you're using or you know you can think of it as an incentive structure and it turns out that systems are ruthless at finding loopholes in whatever incentive structure you create um you know a favorite example of mine uh, comes from Astro Teller who is now the head of Google X but in his grad student days he was building uh, a system to play uh, robotic soccer or uh, robotic football, I guess I should say. Um, and he wanted to incentivize the system to take possession of the ball because that's a that's a useful thing to do if you're trying to win a soccer game. Uh, and so he created, you know, a one one hundredth of a goal incentive for taking possession of the ball. Uh, what did the system learn to do? Did it learn to run, you know, a synchronized offense? No, it learned to approach the ball and just vibrate its robotic paddle, uh, quote unquote, taking possession of the ball, you know, 50 times a second. Um, and so that's a perfect example of how these schemes can go wrong. And if you talk to really anyone working in this research area, they have their own supply of stories of their incentive scheme going wrong. Um, and it really points to just this fundamental difficulty in taking behavior that we want and expressing it in numerical terms. Uh, you know, you see this even, even with video games, which you'd think are already this kind of formal structure that has points in it. Um, if you build AI to get as many points as possible, you often find that it does these degenerate things, you know, so even in a game like Super Mario Brothers, uh, you get points for, you know, collecting coins and things, but that's not actually the objective of the game. The objective of the game is to save the princess. Um, so the, an AI that's distracted by just collecting as many coins as possible is not doing the right thing. Um, and this has ended up being a really fundamental question. Uh, so if, it's, if we can't even define the reward function for a Nintendo game, how can we hope to define a reward function for something like driving a car or outputting code or you know whatever it is that we want to do in the real world? This, in turn, has led to, I think, one of the most interesting uh, new developments in the field, which is what's called reward modeling. The basic idea here is that you punt the question of how to operationalize your reward to the AI system itself. Um, what do I mean by that? So let's say you're working on a large language model and you want to use it to summarize documents. By default, language models have this, um, what's called the pre-training objective, which is just to fill in the blank of a missing word in an existing, you know, text corpus. Uh, 
Uh, and but this is exactly what gives you these problems of you know a sexist document is going to have a sexist summary or a misspelled document will have a misspelled summary and that's not what you want. You want you know an an accurate good summary no matter what the document is. How does your system know what a good quote unquote a good summary is? You know that's an extremely nebulous human concept. Um, what you can do. And, and, you know, needless to say, it would be hopeless to try to create some mathematical equation that expresses what a good summary is. I mean, that seems insane. So what you can do instead is hire a bunch of contractors on, you know, Amazon Mechanical Turk or something to write a bunch of summaries of the same article. And then you hire another bunch of contractors to come and rank those summaries, which ones they think are the best and which are the worst. You then train a machine learning system to predict the ranking that a human will assign to a given summary. So all of the hard work of figuring out how the syntax and the grammar and all of these things contribute to the final ranking score, we've pushed all of that work into the neural network itself. And we've just said, here's a bunch of text, predict the ranking that a human is going to give them. Turns out that you can actually do this. And you can develop uh, what's called a reward model that will predict the score that a person would give to a piece of text. And once you have the reward model, you can then train the language system to output texts which the reward model scores highly. And you can test them. And humans really do say, yeah, this is a pretty good summary. Um, so work like that. I mean, this is really the cutting edge right now of machine learning. You know, this the paper I'm referring to from OpenAI came out like three weeks ago. So um, this is really kind of a snapshot of where we're at right now. Um, but I find that incredibly encouraging. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not, it is not a priori obvious that we would be able to operationalize something like a good summary um, and put that into a reinforcement learning system. But it turns out that we appear to have a process for taking these nebulous preferences and norms out of people's heads and actually putting them into a system uh, in, a, in a repeatable fashion. I think it's pretty striking. It's pretty encouraging. Of course, it raises all of the usual problems of, uh, you know, interpretability. Let's, let's pop the hood of our reward model and make sure it's, you know, it cares about the things that we're trying to get it to care about. Uh, let's think about training data. Let's think... Who, who were the people who ranked these summaries and do their preferences reflect the preferences that our users are going to have? Um, all of those questions and more exist. What do you do when the rankers disagree? Mm -hmm. um, so dealing with um, kind of heterogeneous preferences is very much an open problem. Then, you know, there's many a PhD student uh, licking their chops at, as we speak, thinking about that. Um, so there's a lot to be done, but I just think it's not obvious that this scheme would have worked at all. And so the fact that it appears to, um, I think, is a is a pretty hopeful sign. Yeah, very interesting. The other concept that I really loved that you talk about in the book is curiosity. Mm -hmm. So should we give or create algorithms that are somehow curious and yes. instead of just simply hardwiring it to a reward function you, you talk about the video game montezuma's revenge i think <laughs> yes. where the the reinforcement ai wasn't very good because what it was about is about exploring new parts do you want to yes yeah. expand on that a little bit yeah this is a great point so you know everything we've been talking about in in the context of reinforcement learning, whether it's language models or video games or Go, has been in the context of this explicit extrinsic reward, you know, um, this kind of carrot and stick from the outside that says, you know, I will give you points if you win the game of Go or whatever. Um, but anyone who's familiar with, you know, human cognition, human psychology knows that uh, many of the things that we do are not driven by some extrinsic reward system, but we do them because they're fun. We do them because they're interesting. Um, if you look at the way that babies in particular play, um, you know, they're, they'll just sort of mess around with objects for their own delight. And it's not because the human is giving them, you know, affection or something as a result. They're just doing it to do it. So 
there's kind of this open question of um, we've we've created AI in the model of maximizing some external reward signal, but we know that that's not you know there, a huge part of what actual actually drives human beings is not that. Um, and so there's been an interest in how do we capture some of that more sort of intrinsic motivation. Okay, so I'm going to put a pin in that uh, and now talk about a practical problem that we couldn't solve until we did this. So you mentioned the uh, video game Montezuma's Revenge. If you look at the 2015 Nature paper that DeepMind put out where they were using neural networks and reinforcement learning to get superhuman performance at all of these different video games. If you scroll your eye down to the bottom, the bottom of their chart, you see um, this particular video game, Montezuma's Revenge, where their algorithm got zero points. Not only was it not superhuman, it got zero points. And so, you know, what the heck is going on there? Well, it turns out this is a video game that is a extremely difficult, you know, you're trying to escape this deadly Aztec pyramid and everything has deadly traps in it. You know, you step on the wrong tile on the floor, you're dead, or you fall through the, you know, crack, you're, you're dead, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the game is very stingy with points. You have to, uh, you know, obtain the first key and open the first door, which takes, you know, this huge chain of things to go right before the game even gives you the first 100 points of, of the game. And so if you build a system that is completely driven by these extrinsic rewards, um, it never figures out that it's even on the right track. You would have to do this entire chain of actions correctly, literally at random, in order to realize like, oh, this is how I'm supposed to play the game. Um, and so what do you do? I mean, the funny thing is that humans have no problem playing the game. I mean, it's a difficult game, but we understand what we're supposed to do. Uh, we're supposed to kind of explore the maze, open the locked door to see what's on the other side. Not because we think the game will award us 200 points for it, but because it's interesting or because we're, we're intrigued, we're curious. And so the people that work on these sorts of systems, um, in particular, there's a researcher named Mark Belmar um, at uh, DeepMind who was working on this. And they said, well, what if we, you know, essentially call up our colleagues in uh, developmental psychology that are working on infant play, infant curiosity, figure out what's their best mathematical model for, you know, how and why babies play with things. And let's plug that into our system. Um, and so they were able to supplement the game's point system with a kind of intrinsic uh, curiosity reward, which basically says, you know, if you see something on the screen that you've never seen before, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, do more of that. Um, and to make a long story somewhat shorter, if you plug in this intrinsic novelty reward, suddenly your agent can play and, and indeed beat this video game that was otherwise com completely impossible. I think that is a really cool story Mm. Um, in terms of showing, showing this, this moment that we're arriving at, I would say with AI, where it's getting sufficiently akin to human decision-making that, you know, the computer scientists need to call up their friends in the psychology department and say, Hey, <laughs> we're stuck on this thing. Um, what have you guys figured out about, you know, motivation and drive and reward and novelty and all these things? Um, so I think it's a, it's kind of a exhilarating convergence of those two fields. Yeah, no, I, I found this super fascinating, this whole, whole concept of building curiosity into our algorithms. Um, the other concept you talk about is corrigibility. So our ability to correct AIs or potentially pull the plug yeah. Um, I, I've had a, a number of conversations with Nick Bostrom, for example, oh, yeah. the Oxford philosopher, which people can, can see back on, on my channel. And he published a book called super intelligence in which he talks about the, the, some of the problems that you, you highlighted that if we don't really, un, if we create a really powerful AI and we don't really define what we want this AI to achieve, then 
if if we gave an AI the 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 job of creating as many uh, paper clips as as we wanted, this AI could then start melting the entire planet down, turning it all into <laughs> into paper clips. So understanding what reward function we give AIs and so do, do you think there's a real danger to human existence in terms of creating super intelligence AIs that that it could maximize a reward function almost as an unintended consequence and and I think more realistically, do we need to really build this ability to pull the plug into our AIs? What are your views on that? Great questions. Yeah. So I do think that if if we are considering what is the you know actual species extinction level risk that AI poses, I think a thought experiment like the paperclip maximizer is a more useful way to think about that kind of risk than, you know, the Terminator or something like this. I think um, it, and that's, I mean, this goes back to Norbert Wiener, who was using the Sorcerer's Apprentice analogy in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. I think it is much less likely that AI will sort of turn on us in some kind of malevolent way, and much more likely that it will uh, enthusiastically carry out the instructions that we've given it, you know, to the letter. And of course, if we've screwed up in every, in any way, then we have this problem of how do we stop it? Um, and, you know, we've seen the, you know, the progress of AI and all the examples that you and I have discussed, um, where, you know, these issues come up and we are able to iterate. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens if you accidentally develop a system that uh, you know, treats an intervention by the human operator as no different to, you know, an enemy in the Atari game that's trying to kill it or something like that. You know, you're, you're reaching around to turn the power switch off on the back of the system, but the system is just this kind of simple reinforcement learning system that says, uh, if he touches my power switch, then I don't get any more points. And so I'm going to like keep, turning around so that he can't reach the, the back. Um, things like that are totally within the realm of plausibility. I don't think we have seen, to my knowledge, a you know headline-worthy example of this sort of thing happening in practice. Uh, there have been systems, for example, in uh, there have been some Atari playing systems that once the agent is about to die, it just pauses the game <laughs> um, and never unpauses it. And so we do see a little bit of this behavior of, um, you know, wanting to avoid, you know, quote unquote, dying or being turned on or uh, turned off rather. Um, so that is something that people think about. And I would say the key insight here uh, comes from people like Stuart Russell, uh, who are thinking about this in terms of uncertainty. Any system that is certain about what its objectives are, and by default, machine learning kind of treats the reward function or the objective function as this, you know, chiseled in stone, handed down, you know, by God uh, thing that it has to maximize. Um, what might it be like to find a way to build a system that was uncertain as to its very its its own objective um and that is the kind of system and Stuart and his lab uh, have a number of papers kind of showing this from a mathematical standpoint that's the kind of system that would be open to intervention because there's the possibility that it might be wrong and so um a human kind of stopping it from doing what it's trying to do may actually be, uh, you know, the appropriate thing. So, but that that's only the case if you have some doubt in that what you're doing is, is the right thing to do. So mm -hmm. that has been, I think, a really interesting frontier is developing systems that are uncertain about 
their own objective. I mean, it's a little bit, uh, sounds a little bit paradoxical because this, this objective is kind of the foundation of the field. But, you know, if you think about, um, you think about a system like we began our conversation with this Uber that couldn't decide whether something was a pedestrian or a cyclist. More and more, we are seeing uh, a push to develop like rigorous accounting of a system's own uncertainty and then ways to use that uncertainty behaviorally. So if you're, if you as a human are driving down the street and you're not sure what's in front of you, that's already a reason to slow down. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think increasingly we are seeing that norm developing in AI. Um, and so not only is it useful to think about the uncertainty that you have about, you know, what you think you're seeing, but also what you think you're even trying to do. Um, and there may be a certain trade off in terms of a system that's too uncertain, you know, might not take actions at all, because it's, you know, paralyzed. Uh, so there may be some interesting trade offs there that we have to navigate. But broadly, I think it's a, a, a very promising way uh, for thinking about how to how to put systems into the real world um, without feeling like we have to get it absolutely right before we turn it on. And we're not going to get another chance, uh, you know, to intervene after that point. Hmm. Um, the, the famous quote from Norbert Wiener is if we use to achieve our purpose, a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere once we have set it going, then we <laughs> had better be quite sure that the purpose we put into the machine is the thing we really want. Hmm. Um, and you can flip it around. I think you, it's just as useful to think about that quote in the reverse, which is, you know, if we use to achieve our purposes, an agency where we know that we haven't completely specified the thing that we want, then we had better be sure that we maintain the ability to intervene. Um, and so uncertainty is a big part of that. Yeah. And, and Stuart Russell is a big, big fan of having the human in the loop as part of this 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 process um so do, do you think we will ever achieve this alignment uh, given that human values and behaviors are, are quite uncertain and very often irrational well that's a great i mean the the concept of irrationality is um i think looms over some of these questions so we've seen early attempts to to grapple with um, uncertainty over a reward function uh, can sometimes be a little bit brittle. So there was a one one paper showing that in a particular framework, uh, once the system observed slightly inconsistent human behavior, it would just kind of conclude like, okay, well, humans are irrational, so I don't have to pay attention to them anymore because what they're doing doesn't even make sense. Um, and that's not what we want. Um, and so I think it's, I mean, this is one of the things that has been on my mind recently and is how how might AI borrow from cognitive science, from behavioral economics, thinking about, you know, human quote unquote irrationality um, and modeling that in a useful way, because fundamentally this set of techniques we've been talking a little bit about uh, is sometimes known as inverse reinforcement learning. So the system observes your behavior and then it makes a guess as to what you're trying to do. Um, and that really involves an inferential leap going from human behavior to human values. Um, based on the way you're acting, here's what I think you value, what your, what your goals are, what your beliefs are. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty sizable leap. And, Humans have to make that leap with each other all the time, and we often get it wrong. Um, I mean, you know, this is a silly example, but, uh, you know, the other day I was out to dinner with someone and they, our drinks came and they held their drink out to me and I took it because I thought they wanted me to try it. But then they were very confused because they just wanted to, you know, clink glasses, right? So there are many cases like this where even, you know, a fully adult human being, you know, trying to uh, 
infer the desires of someone they know quite well, even then we can get it wrong. And so I think it, this is a this is a really rich area right now where if you look at the part of inverse reinforcement learning systems where you know we make that inferential leap, I see it as this giant sort of caution tape zone where it's like insert some more refined understanding of human behavior here. Um, you know, insert uh, you know everything we know from you know prospect theory, Danny Kahneman, you know behavioral economics, cognitive science, like figure that part out. And um, what's striking to me is that a lot of these systems work really well, even though we have only the, the merest provisional answer to that. But I, I think it's very much an area that we need to kind of build out further. Where's, where's next for you in terms of your own research, your own interest? Where, where would you like to go and explore in terms of AI and machine intelligence in the future? The things that are the most on my mind at the moment are, first of all, this question of how do we make inferences about people's values based on their behavior? I mm -hmm. think that's, as I say, I think that's a huge part of the question of making AI go right, but it's also a way in which um, AI is in dialogue with some of these older fields. Um, and you know, so what? How can AI both learn from and contribute to something like revealed preference theory or something like this? Um, I think that's really, really interesting, uh, and there's a lot to be worked out there. Um, I'm also really interested in the idea of trust in computing mm -hmm. because I think that's the other pillar of our relationship with computers generally or our relationship with one another as mediated by technology and certainly our relationship that we're going to come to have with AGI. I mean, yeah. there's something uh, kind of intimate about the idea of some AI system that knows your preferences and values so deeply that it can just kind of act on your behalf. Yeah. Um, and that's a situation where, you know, trust is paramount. And so I'm interested in how computer systems, uh, you know, what, what can be done to engender trust? Is trust always necessarily a good thing? Or sometimes should we be distrustful? Um, what are the ways that human uh, networks of trust undergird these sort of computational systems? Um, so, you know, you, you know, to give one example, uh, internet traffic is secured using, you know, HTTPS. This comes, you know, these HTTPS certificates come from certificate authorities. Well, who, you know, decides to trust the certificate authority? If you kind of peel back the layers, you find that, you know, there's actual human beings at Chrome that are sort of vouching for actual human beings at, you know, Let's Encrypt or one of these certificate authorities. So there's a very rich interplay between the human mechanisms of trust and these sort of computational mechanisms of trust. So those are the two things that are on my mind, and I think they will keep me busy for a few years yet. Uh, absolutely. So finally, what are your hopes and predictions for the future when you look at the field of AI and machine learning? What do you see? What do you hope for? I broadly think about AI as a force multiplier for existing structures. So I think AI in a totalitarian country can kind of strengthen the grip of totalitarianism. I think AI in a democratic uh, you know, society can empower individuals uh, I think AI in a kind of capitalistic society can kind of further entrench capitalistic norms. Um, so in some ways, um, you know, the, the things that concern me the most about AI and the things about which I'm the most hopeful are continuous with the things I'm fearful and hopeful about in the world at large. Um, you know, I think of climate change, 
for example, as a case where, you know, you can think of it as an, an alignment problem that we have this reward function called shareholder returns or GDP per capita. And we know how to make that number go up and we can do extremely sophisticated, impressive things to make that number go up. But it turns out that there were some externalities. There were some things that we cared about that we didn't quite manage to fit into the reward function. And those things end up going sideways. And so that's the classic thing that people are worried about in AI. But I think it's just as applicable to society as a whole. I mean, you see the same thing in the American education system that we've created this uh, elaborate testing regime to measure educational progress. But we've really then just developed a system for teaching to the test or maximizing scores uh, without necessarily improving education or maybe even regressing on education. So I think a way in which I feel hopeful is that the AI community has learned, I think, a, a lesson, which is that manually designing reward functions is simply too dangerous. Uh, it's simply too likely to fail. Um, so instead, we're, as a field, moving towards reward modeling, where we're going to start with human preferential judgments as like the, the primitives, and we'll build the operational part off of that. And we might not even particularly care about it, you know, so maybe we care about how this neural network implements the idea of a good summary, or maybe we don't. Uh, maybe we just say it seems to work and that's okay. Um, might there be a possibility for the future of corporate governance and political governance that looks a little bit more like that? I think the history of, uh, in particular, the 20th century has really been about, you know, developing explicit, you know, K KPIs and metrics um, and using those as targets, both for, you know, the economic health of a country or, you know, or public health for that matter. I mean, it could be anything or, you know, the performance of a division within an organization. Um, what might it be like to imagine a world of corporate and institutional and, and social governance that looks a little bit more like reward modeling, where we mm -hmm. simply, simply show people, here are two, here are two outcomes which one do you like better? You know, here's two, here's two hypothetical front pages of the newspaper from next year, which of these describes a world that you'd rather live in? Um, or, you know, which of these two, uh, uh, you know, shareholder reports from, you know, two quarters from now looks healthier to you. And the system can back out the actual metrics to target based on our preferences and those preferences can be things that are so you know ineffable that we don't know how to put them into words let alone numbers mm. i think we're just at the beginning of thinking about how to take some of these techniques that are currently being used in ai and think about human incentive structures in that same way very good. Thank you so much, Brian. That was such a fascinating conversation. I could go on for, for hours. So ho hopefully <laughs> we'll, we'll repeat this at some point. Yeah, so it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me.